Click the link in the description below for a chance to win 10 classic best-selling Law of Attraction books. We hope you enjoy this presentation. If so, please click the like button and click the subscribe button below to receive notification when we release new recordings. Richard Hargraves presents The Pearl of Great Price by Neville Goddard. This audio edition recorded 2023. Digitally narrated using the voice of Jeff Masters for BuildingMentalMuscle.com, copyright 2023 Iron Power Publishing. All rights reserved. The Pearl of Great Price by Neville Goddard. Tonight's subject is Pearl of Great Price. This is taken from the 13th chapter, the Gospel of Matthew, 45 and 46 verses. It's all about the kingdom of heaven. And first of all, let us say that the kingdom of heaven is simply that state in which man rises, where everything is completely subject to his imaginative power. He is destined to be an heir, one with his father who was God, where everything is put under his power. Here is a quote from this 13th of Matthew, The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. It is my hope that I can bring you to that pearl tonight. You may not value it to the point where you're willing to sell all that you have to buy it. But I will tell you of the spell. Very few are willing to sell all and buy the pearl, but that we now quote from another passage of the Gospels, the 11th chapter of the book of Luke, the 21st through the 23rd. What a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace, but when one stronger than he assails him and overcomes him, he takes from him the armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. The very next line, as though it's an afterthought, throws all the light in the world upon that statement. He who is not with me is against me. There is no benevolent neutrality, none whatsoever. He who was not with me is my enemy, he is against me. So, we find the one who was completely in control of this kingdom of heaven. And I tell you, that being, is called in scripture, Christ. But Christ is defined as the power and the wisdom of God in the first chapter of the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. Don't look for a man. A man is only the instrument through which that power and this wisdom is exercised. But Christ himself is the power and the wisdom of God. You and I are the instruments through which this power and this wisdom is exercised. So, Paul makes the statement, from now on we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once regarded Christ from a human point of view, we regard him thus no longer. And then he, the author of that statement, defines Christ for us. Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. Now we are told by him, all things were made, and without him was not anything made that was made, but nothing. And so, we invite you now to test Christ in you, again from the letters of Paul, the 13th chapter, the 5th verse. In fact, read it through to the 7th verse. But I'll quote you the fifth, examine yourselves to see whether you are holding to the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless of course you fail to meet the test. I hope you will discover that we have not failed. And then he gives us a warning, for now he's speaking only of power. Power and wisdom personified in the form of one called Christ, Jesus. And now he warns us. I hope and I'll pray to God that you do not use it in the wrong way. Even if you think, he's implying now, that I have not used it to the full of my knowledge. I rather that you hear and feel that I have made a mistake or I have failed, and that you use it evenly, implying stating why openly, 
No one comes unto the Father, but by me. And here he defines it that he is the only way in the world, to everything in this world that you and I see. And it takes everything that we own, as to beliefs that we think our powers to guide our life, to pay for that pearl of great price. If you think for one moment you can hold on to one little thing, in the event this doesn't work, you can't buy the pearl. And so, when I buy the pearl, I go all out and live by it, and there is no other being in the world, just this pearl, and I live by it. This pearl is your own wonderful human imagination, that's Christ. Now, I see her in the audience tonight. Last Friday night, this sweet lady told me the story. She went into the baker to buy the usual things that we buy when we go to a bakery, and the lady who waited on her didn't look well. And she, without asking the reasons for her present appearance, in her own mind's eye, when she got home, she talked to her as though she stood before her physically. She didn't sit down, she didn't relax, didn't go into a trance, just brought her before her mind's eye, and heard her say that she felt so well. And she complimented on the way she looked, she looked so well. And this was a communion between two souls, how she looked so well. And she believed in the reality of her imaginal act. One week later, she goes back into the same bakery, and here is this lady, same lady, but radiant, so radiant it prompted a response from this one, and she said, but you look so well, what has happened? Well, she said, this past week, I inherited some money. I paid all of my bills, I paid everything that I owed in this world, and so I have no debts, and I have money. This lady is totally unaware of the gift she received from the lady who was present here tonight, totally unaware of it. Now listen to these words and try to put any other interpretation upon them in the world, and then tell me if you can. This is from the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. You don't need the consent of any being in this world to hear good news for them. You don't have to say, do you want me to hear it? Do you want praise? If you ask them in advance, should I hear good news for you, or only asking in the event that it works, they'll praise you, or in some way give you something. You don't ask anyone for their permission to hear good news, for, inasmuch as you have heard it, as you've done it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. And when you did not do it, you did not do it unto me. And so, every moment of time, there's the opportunity to do it unto Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus, being your own wonderful human imagination, and to see man in need and not act in your own wonderful imaginations, as she did, is to keep the wounds open and add more and more stripes upon the body of Christ Jesus. For the only Christ Jesus is in you, as your only wonderful human imagination. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Come, test yourself, and see. What a wonderful invitation. Test yourself. How would I test myself? Well, this is how you test yourself. I tell you that if you imagine, as this lady did, that someone stands before you in bodily form, though it cannot be seen with your mortal eye. But actually, you imagine they are standing before you, and you carry on a conversation with them, from the premise of your fulfilled desire for them. And then, you feel them as you would feel them with their now solidly present, and you believe in the reality of that imaginal act. It is done and how it happens, you need not be concerned, it has its own manner of externalizing itself within their world. All you need do is do it, as it has told us, is the first chapter of the book of James. But he said, Receive with meekness the implanted word. The word is called Christ Jesus, the power and the wisdom of God. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers, deceiving yourselves. So, when he tells me to be the doer of the word, the world thinks it means to go out 
and make some physical effort. No. James is not telling me to substitute works for faith. Works are the evidence as to whether the faith that I profess is alive or dead. Is it alive? If it is alive, I will act upon it. If it's not alive, then I won't act upon it. I haven't yet bought the pearl of great price. When I buy the pearl of great price, there is no other pearl like it. I sell all in this world to buy it. I sell all beliefs and powers, other than my own wonderful human imagination. And everyone, because he has imagination and everyone can imagine, and everyone can believe in the reality of his imaginal act, he is free. It sets a man free. So, we are told if you believe my word, and abide in my words, then you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Well, how does he define the truth? Said, I am the truth. He said, if you know my word, you know the truth, and I am the truth. If you abide in this, then you'll be set free. It means that if I simply imagine that I am the man that I would love to be, that's all that I need to do. Just try it. Imagine that you are already the man that you would like to be. The woman you like to be, your friends are how you want them to be, and total strangers are as you would like them to be. Just imagine it, try it, test yourself, and see. As you test yourself and it happens, well then, can you turn back to the belief in any power outside of Christ Jesus? It's finding who we use, and I tell you, Christ Jesus is your own wonderful human imagination. Christ in you must resurrect, and so you start to exercise Him, believing in Him, believe in the Lord Christ Jesus, and be saved. And so, I begin to believe in Him, put all my trust in Him, it doesn't matter where I start in life, behind the eight ball makes no difference. I start believing in Him and only in Christ Jesus, and I take off from there, giving my entire life to Him, just as though there were no others. Just Christ Jesus, and I have found Him, He's my own wonderful human imagination. When I believe in Him to that extent, things happen. Now she tells me the same lady, that's why I named this tonight, the Pearl of Great Price. She had a dream and here was all mud, nothing but mud, whirling mud. And as it whirled and whirled and well before her mind's eye, in her dream, she noticed a small, perfectly beautiful, perfect pearl and she picked it up and held this perfect pearl. It wasn't big, but it was a perfect pearl in her hand, and then she woke. Now this pearl, she found in the series of experiences that she conducted for a boy who came east, came from the east to the west, with instructions that if he couldn't find a job in the immediate present, he had to return to the east. And so, she simply on a Friday night saw him, not physically, but in her mind's eye, as though he stood before her physically, and congratulated him on the job, just as though it was a true physical contact. On Monday the party got the job and therefore did not have to return to the east coast. Now here is a young lady, I call her a young lady. Can't be more than her early twenties, I looked at her through my eyes. All things being relative she has three little babies, but I wouldn't think she's more than her early twenties. I'd be surprised if she passed beyond the middle twenties. Looking at her, born in Italy of a Catholic family, Catholic faith brought to this meeting of ours by her mother-in-law and adopted this concept of Christ Jesus. Our family despairs because they think unless you have their concept of Christ Jesus, there is no entrance into the kingdom of heaven as they understand it. But I tell her she's well into it, she's exercising the only Christ Jesus in the world. He calls upon us to test him every moment of time, but you can't buy him unless you pay the price. And the price, it takes everything that you have to buy. Listen to the words, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. 
who, finding one pearl of great value, went and sold everything that he had and bought it. The average person would say, well, after all, I know that's all well and good, but Sanka does keep me in a state of sleep when normal coffee keeps me awake, and I know that an extra martini does so and so to me, and I'll take none, or maybe I should take vodka because it's good for my breath, and not the martini. And a thousand things in the world people have concerning what they should do. Every belief, inner power, outside of Christ Jesus, you give up, as you give it up and hold on to him and only to him, then you've bought the pearl, and then you exercise it. The greatest value in the world is Christ Jesus. So here she has tonight, I think she has the pearl of great price. I hope you tonight will accept it. You know, not everyone who finds Christ Jesus saw him, you know. They're brought to him by one who found him. In the gospel, Philo found him and then he brought his friend Nathaniel. Nathaniel wasn't seeking him, Nathaniel was waiting for things to happen, for he knew the scripture backwards. When Nathaniel heard that the Messiah had appeared, he said, What can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Jesus said of him, An Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. His scripture, Peter wasn't seeking him, his brother Andrew found him, and Andrew went and called his brother Peter, and said, We have found him of whom Moses and the law spoke, and all the prophets spoke. So, they were not looking for him, but they found him because someone found him and was so interested in what they found, they wanted to share it. Results that they're loved for, if he is all that we claim that he is, we can't keep it to ourselves. We have to share it. And so maybe this night, a total stranger may be here who is really not overly eager to change their concept of Christ Jesus. They aren't seeking another concept of him at all, and maybe you will be interested enough to test what I'm talking about and see if this is not Christ Jesus. For listen to it, by him all things are made, and without him there was not anything made that was made. Well now, here a lady brought into being something that she had imagined, without devising the means by which it would happen. She simply imagined it. Didn't she make it? She certainly made it without the consent of the one for whom she made it. Well, if she made it and all things are made by him, she didn't say to herself, how did I make it? I only imagined it. Therefore, he must be imagination. I'm this being in action, must be imagining. There it is. So, she found them, she tried it again and it worked. And someone tries it a third time, at twelfth time, a hundred times, and it works. But if I say this to someone in the world, and they won't even try it. Well, you know in science, to demand proof before you're willing to make the experiment is nonsense. It's only through the experiment and its working out in performance that proof can be received by us. So, to demand proof before our next experiment is stupid. So, I say to the world, if there is evidence for a thing, then what the world thinks about it, or even wishes for it, is nothing to the point. It makes no difference whatsoever what the world thinks about this if I can prove it in performance. If I say to you, take a friend who is now unemployed, and bring him before your mind's eye, as the lady did, and see him now gainfully employed. He need not be physically present, but he's not physically present, but to treat him as though he were, and put your mental hands upon him, and give him the solidity that it would be, would be there were it true and then carry on a mental conversation with him from the premise that it is true. I heard him tell you that he is gainfully employed, and that he loves what he is doing. There is such opportunities just growth in what he is doing. And do nothing outside of that. Listen to the words of Pearl concerning Christ. Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. It's not only power blind power, it's wisdom, the wisdom of God. If it's the wisdom of God, 
It knows how to navigate the whole vast world and move it to bring this one into a gainfully employed state. All you need to do is believe in Christ Jesus, and that is the pearl of great price. No power in the world can stop it. All it needs is acceptance on the part of us. So here when there is a strong man and he's fully armed, and he guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when one stronger than he assails him and overcomes him, he takes from him the armor in which he believed, and then disposes of the spoil. Divides the spoil. Now, that wonderful statement, he who is not with me is against me, he who does not gather with me scatters, is so irrelevant to the theme that preceded it, and it throws all the light in the world upon that statement. Some power in the world comes into man's mind is Christ Jesus. And you don't need a social standing, a financial background, intellectual background, any of these backgrounds to feel secure in the world. You found him, and this is the one who can overcome all the powers of the world. And if you are not with him, then you are against it. You wouldn't think that in this world today, we have countries that are called neutralist countries. Benevolent neutral is not in Scripture. Are you with me or against me? You're either with me or you're my enemy. Can you imagine that I am either for him or I am his enemy? Can't be neutral. I either believe in it or I don't believe in it. Under the 900 million Christians in the world, how many really believe in the true Christ? They believe in lighting a candle, they believe in change, affliction, and all the other things in the world. And I wouldn't criticize any of them. Leave them until they find the true Christ. I'm going to find the true Christ then it doesn't really matter, whether you eat meat or don't eat beef, either you drink or don't drink, whether you smoke or don't smoke, whether you do any of these things, it makes nothing whatsoever to do with the true Christ. For you do not give power to anything outside of Christ, and Christ is your own wonderful human imagination. That's Christ. So, when you go before anyone, don't even take thought as to what you're going to say, just imagine the end, and have him pronounce his judgment based upon the aim you had predetermined. Do that, live this way in the world trusting 100% in the pearl of great price. May I tell you, it will not fail you, but you can't modify it. You can't hold back one little reserved thing. I am speaking from experience, not knowing that it was my own imagination that predicted accurately through the medium of the cards and the medium of the stars, I held back a little reserved note in my mind's eye when I found Christ. I was still here in my mind's eye my old horoscope, I could quickly arrange its progression, I would know the day and justify failure. So, the rule of my second house in conflict with the rules of my sixth can get the job, there's no money to it. It's all there, it's all in my mind's eye. I have to completely give it up, and so tear up my horoscope in my mind's eye, it doesn't exist. I had to completely destroy it as a power that guided me. But I held it because I successfully portrayed events for a numbered people in New York City. I had almost the entire metropolitan crowd, the entire metropolitan opera, they came to me. And I so believed in what I did, I predicted with conviction, it worked, and they were so sold on it. And then I had to have an experience one day to show me it was only my own intense belief in these little symbols that made them work. I came into my friend's home that I taught her how to read charts, how to set them up. Her name was Carpenter, Norma Carpenter. And I taught her. And then, having retired from a teaching profession in Scranton, Pennsylvania, she had a small pension from the railroad where her husband worked, plus a small pension from her former job. So, she made a living, but though she could augment it in a nice way by telling and reading charts. And I taught her how to do it. When I came to her place one day, 
she lived in a hotel, Norma was in tears. I said, what's wrong, Norma? But she said a man called me up, he was recommended by a friend of mine, and he was very eager to see me right away. He had this fantastic deal on so over the phone before he arrived, he gave me his birthday, his hour, and everything about it. And so, I erected the chart. When he came, I told him, I am so convinced of this good fortune falling his way today that I can close the book on it. He said, Mrs. Carpenter, if you're telling me the truth, I will give you a hundred dollars. And she said, so confidently, give it to me now, because it has to work today. And she gave me all the reasons which I knew I taught them to us, how they had to work today because of this transiting moon over these certain aspects of the chart. He said, no, if it works you will get it today, but I will not give it to you now. What's wrong with that? She said, I wrote it, I made up this chart from a bound volume of ephemerides. I was sitting at the open window when it's hot. And so, I turned away. I was diverted and when I went back, I didn't realize the wind had blown over the pages and I erected a chart of a man who was born ten years before this man. This man wasn't even born. I progressed my chart from this horoscope made up ten years before the birth of this man. I said, Norma, did you believe it when you spoke to him? Jesus, certainly I did, I said, forget it, just completely forget it, it's done. I was in her room, our suite of rooms that night. Around eight, right, a Western Union boy came upstairs and delivered a check, a Western Union check for $100. And the chart was drawn from a man who wasn't born. He was born ten years after this chart of a man, but Norma cannot sell that because she feels they all believed in me. She cannot buy the pearl of great price because she feels her only security is to get her little small check from the railroad in Pennsylvania and her small check from the schoolhouse in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And eke it out with this so she cannot give up and buy the pearl. You've got to give up every belief in this world enough power outside of Christ to buy Christ. There is nothing but Jesus Christ. You either believe in him or you don't believe in him. And any little reservation for a rainy day will rain, so you hold back the belief in stars. But I'm confessing having done it so successfully over the years, I still carried in my mental furniture my chart. And so, you see you could always justify a failure. And as Blake said, self-justification is the voice of hell. I didn't know it in hell, everyone is justifying himself. You know what he does if it's a failure, he justifies it because you are the reasons in the world. But hell is not a place outside of earth, it's right here, so we are in the hell justifying failure, which I couldn't do it because look at my Venus. And then as soon as Venus gets beyond the point where it interferes with me, but I still have Mercury, and so there I go. And when in spite of Venus and Mercury something happens, oh why didn't I see this whether it was all alone, a man goes back and reflects and then again justifies. No, he went and sold all that he had and bought it, all that he had not a few things, you can't just buy it with a few of the things that you will dispose of. Yet you can use it, use it wisely and successfully. But you don't really possess him, that pearl, unless you buy him. And you can only buy him when you sell everything that you have, and then buy him. And so, that it's all out or nothing. So, he who is not with me is against me, and I know it's the difficult thing, but is it worthwhile having, when you consider that by having Christ Jesus, you are rising into a world of an entirely new order? For everything is subject to your imaginative power. You're not here at all. You're moving the world of death into the world of life, when you find him, and making one with you. So, you take it and they left me tonight.
A quick summary will take me no more than one minute to do it. Two minutes the most. You take this pattern, it's going to happen to you. Crucifixion is over, for all of us, you are going to be crucified. I have been crucified with Christ. It is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, and gave himself for me. That is Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20, and Romans, chapter 6, verse 5. If we have been united with Christ in the death like his, that's past, change of tense, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this, that's to be. Now we are told, there are those who are misleading the people by teaching that the resurrection is over and past. The resurrection is not, it's to be. It is taking place one after the other. So, believe me, the crucifixion came first, that's over. The second stage in the unfolding drama is resurrection. The second stage, when man awakens in a grave to find that he was all along dead, or he wouldn't awaken the grave. You don't put anyone in the tomb unless he's dead. So, you awake in the tomb of your skull to find that it wasn't what you thought it was, it was a tomb. And then, at that very moment, that you discover in the act of resurrecting it, it's now converted from a tomb into a womb, and then comes the birth. So is crucifixion, resurrection, birth from above, these are the three stages. Then comes the first stage. The first age is when the title of titles is conferred upon the one who was born from above. For conferred upon the risen Christ in the experience of man is the divine title, Father. And no one can utter the word Father but the Son, and so the Son, God's only begotten Son, calls you Father. And then the title is conferred upon you and your Father, one with God, because He is God's Son, and He calls you Father, and you know it. Then comes the next stage, the final stage, frame the temple and its wonderful curtain that separated man from God is stoned from top to bottom so that now you have direct access to the being that you were and are, the thing that is done. No intermediary between yourself and God. Go straight to the being that you really are, which being is done. So, these are the five perfect stages and all the others told about him will happen in their own wonderful way, regardless of the order in which they happen, but this series as I just gave it to you, this is the sequence. We are already crucified, and all will be, eventually, individually resurrected. And then after the resurrection become a spiritual birth, where he is born into an entirely different sphere. And then on him is conferred, in that sphere the divine title, the Father, and it takes God's only Son, to confer the title for the Son comes and calls you, Aranoi my Lord my Father, in fulfillment of Scripture, in fulfillment of the 89th Psalm. And then comes the final one, when the curtain of the temple is torn from top to bottom, and everything is split, all the rocks are split, and all the earthquakes. And then you rise, as you're told you must rise, in this form that cannot be described, as called in the scripture, the yellow rim, a celestial being, and the close, closest they can come to describe in the yellow beam is a fiery serpent, does exactly what you are, and feel, and see, when you rise. Human yes, but for all the identity of personality, a radical discontinuity of form, and there you rise in the whole world quick, it's all within you, the whole drama takes place in the individual. You do not rise from the body, you rise in the body, you do not awaken from the body, you awaken in the body. The whole thing takes place within the individual, but tonight you believe me, and if you didn't know this was the pearl of great price, and I brought it to you this night, I hope you'll buy it, but like all the great things of scripture, come buy wine, buy and look without money, without price, the only price you pay for it, not dollars and cents. You give up your belief in powers outside of Christ Jesus, and Christ Jesus is your own wonderful human imagination. 
End of lecture. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. If so, please click the like button and click the subscribe button below to receive notification when we release new recordings. Click the link in the description below for a chance to win 10 classic best-selling Law of Attraction books 